I'd like to thank the Saskatchewan Library Association again for hosting One Book, One Province. Please take some time to listen to Paul as he goes through some of his readings from his book, um, Blanket Toss Under the Midnight Sun. I want you to sort of go back as well. Some of you that are young, you might be intrigued by this to actually have somebody read a book to you. Uh, some of us that are a little bit older, I want you to reflect back. I'm remembering being on the reserve, closing my eyes, listening to the radio, and the occasional evening, a song, not a song, a story would be told over the radio. It was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. So I think by doing this as well, you'll now enter a, another part of my world to be reintroduced to storytelling um, in a different form as well by, by being orated to you. Uh, so please, if this entices you to pick up a book or actually read the entire book, uh, please, uh, I'm hoping your yearning for learning and reading is intrigued by, um, by the Saskatchewan Library Association continuing to invest in uh, literature and new literature that's starting to arise in the province. So thank you again, Jay McGwitch. Have a great day. Hello, Tanze. My name is Paul Sizzaquasis, and I am the author of the One Book, One Province 2021 selection, Blanket Toss Under Midnight Sun. Let me tell you a little about myself. I'm from, my family's from Beardies Okamasis, which is a uh, First Nation, about 45 minute drive north of Saskatoon. Uh, I've lived in Saskatchewan most of my life. Uh, on and off I've traveled, of course, but my family and my roots are here. Um, my mom was one of the first registered nurses, Indigenous registered nurses in the province of Saskatchewan and was always an inspiration for me. Um, I've also worked as a writer, uh, curator, uh, ar archivist, self-taught archivist uh, of Indigenous images and photographs. One Book, One Province aims to increase literacy and to create a reading culture by providing opportunities for residents to become more socially engaged in their community through a shared story. One Book, One Province encourages Saskatchewan's social, economic and cultural development while supporting libraries and collaboration. In that spirit, I hope that you will enjoy this reading and be encouraged to visit our, your local library or independent bookstore to borrow or buy or read more. The Saskatchewan Library Association would like to thank Sask Lotteries, who provide funding to Sask Culture, and in turn, the Saskatchewan Library Association. We also owe a big thank you to the Saskatchewan Writers Guild, whose sponsorship helps to make one book possible, and also for their assistance in promoting the project. The Saskatchewan Library Association's work and support reaches lands covered by Treaties 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10, and the traditional lands of the Cree, Dakota, Dene, Lakota, Nakota, and Sotho peoples, and homeland of the Métis. In 1951, anthropologist Catherine McClellan, known simply as Katie to many of the locals, took the photo of then 14-year-old Emma Alfred holding a beaver foot purse that her mother had just made for her. As Marie Blackheetka, who was also a young girl at the time, recalled, we saw Katie and Julie, anthropologists along with Douglas Leachman, who were recording legends, histories, and other stories from the oral cult cultures of the Klingit and Northern Tichoni people. The land around Pele Crossing in the Yukon has a deep history. Halfway between Whitehorse and Dawson City, it has long been a trading post where Northern Tichoni and coastal Klingit would meet and trade, as well as set up fishing camps in the summer. The Hudson's Bay Company, built a trading post there, Fort Selkirk, and many of the Toshone people settled in the area while com continuing to trap, hunt, fish, and gather in the traditional areas. This area was an active place of trade long before the Klondike Gold Rush of 1896 to 1899. Emma Alfred remembers helping her mother sew the beaver foot purse. It had distinctive uh, beaver claws on the front, and the word Yukon sewn on the sides. The purse was newly finished the day Catherine McClellan took the photograph outside the family tent. 
I just came out of swimming and then my mom told me to hold the purse to take that photo, Alfred recalled later. So there was proof right there that this was my mom's purse. After that, sometime after that, the purse somehow disappeared. Alfred knew it had been sold, but there was no record of who the buyer was or where it might have ended up. Alfred assumed she would never see it again and that it was in someone's personal collection, a museum, maybe packed away in some garage. It could be almost anywhere in the world. Employed as a support worker for the Selkirk First Nation, Alfred was among a delegation of elders from the Yukon who visited the Canadian Museum of History in Ottawa in 2015, funded by the Yukon Community Development Fund. They were there to identify artifacts from the region and possibly begin the act of repatriation that would one day bring some of the ob objects home to, the dis to be displayed within their own nations. As well, they listened to audio recordings from the late 1940s and early 1950s that had been gathered by McClellan, Cruikshank, and Leachman. For many of the elders on that trip, it would be a poignant experience, hearing their parents' or grandparents' voices for the first time, speaking in their own language for the first time in years. The trip to the museum held one more surprise for Alfred. As the elders were shown the artifacts from the region, she saw, for the first time in over 60 years, the purse, that purse, that she and her mum had lovingly made. It was quite the sight to see, she recalled. She hopes that someday, and this was at the time I was writing out the book, the purse will return to Pelly Crossing. 